Today's Torah parasha is a double Torah portion covering both parasha Behar from Leviticus 25.1 through 26.2, as well as parasha Behukotai covering Leviticus 26 verse 3 through chapter 27. Now, Behar is the Hebrew word meaning on the mount, and you'll hear this in the fifth word of our opening verse this morning. This is the 32nd Torah portion combined with the 33rd Torah portion in our annual Torah readings. And Behar tells about the laws of the sabbatical years we call a Shemitah, and also about the Jubilee, and also the limits on debts of servitude that are set free in the year of Jubilee and on the Shemitah years. Our double Torah portion with Begukotai is the 33rd Torah portion, and it means by my decrees. It's actually, if you look at the word, the root word is the hok laws, those laws that we don't always understand fully, but we observe by faith. In this case, the tense is huk, Behukotai, meaning in or by my decrees. And it mainly covers chapters 26 and 27, covering the blessings that we receive for obeying God's laws, all his different kinds of laws, and the loss of blessings when we live out of harmony with those laws. And it also covers vows. Our Torah portion opens up this morning in Leviticus 25.1 with the words, Vai daber Adonai el Moshe. And the Lord spoke to Moshe, Behar sine lemor, in or on Mount Sinai, saying. And interestingly, Midrash states that God chose to give his Torah on Mount Sinai since it is the smallest of the mountains, suggesting humility. And in fact, God, who is selfless, lowered himself from the heavens in humility and compassion to give this instructions in how to love God and how to love our fellow man to his beloved children so that they might know how to emulate his humility and compassion in their lives. Thus, Bahar on the Mount has some very intriguing commandments in it, most of which can only be performed in the land of Israel. But when we review the history of the ancient Israelites, we find that our forefathers, unfortunately, did not honor God in following these commandments of giving the land its rest, the Shemitah laws. And this is why they were actually expelled from the land. We are told that for 490 years, they disregarded these commands. And since these are seven cycles of seven, 490 years equals exactly seven times 70. And this is why the Jews were judged and expelled from the land for 70 years. This Torah portion also details various commands related to the Jubilee year. Hashem tells us that the land is to have a sabbatical rest every cycle of 49 years. Then a Jubilee year is pronounced on the first year of the next cycle, called the 50th year, but it's also the first year of the next cycle. And it is always proclaimed with the blowing of the shofar on Yom Kippur of that year. During this Jubilee year, there is to be no farming, and the land is to remain fallow. And our Parsha discusses the laws of redemption and the appropriate return of property to its original owners during this year of Jubilee and the regulations relating to proper treatment of slaves and servants, and the redeeming of poor men who are in debt. And the parsha ends with Hashem telling us that we will be blessed if we follow Abba's instructions in this. Leviticus 25, 1-6 says, And Adonai spoke unto Moshe in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. That which grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, neither gather the grapes of your vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land and the Sabbath of the land shall be food for you, and for your servants, and for your maids, and your hired servants, and for the stranger that sojourns with you. 
Thus, we see the laws for the sabbatical year and the jubilee. The sabbatical year, the, called the Shemitah, is a cycle of seven years. And seven of those Shemitah years would complete the jubilee cycle. And the following year, the Yovel, the word for jubilee in Hebrew, would be announced on Yom Kippur. So everything is based on sevens. The Shemitah, the seven-year cycle, parallels the seven days of creation and the Sabbath day rest. And the number seven in the Bible is symbolic for perfection and completion. And the number seven represents the cycle of completion in the creation. Thus, the seven cycles of seven years led up to the Yovel Jubilee and represents the perfection of perfections. In other words, an ultimate perfection. In the stone edition, Chumash, it translates verse 2 as, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall observe a Sabbath rest for the Lord. And though the rabbis say this does not imply that Hashem rests, it acknowledges the fact that as Hashem rested after his creation of the world, so too Israel rested in the seventh year from its agricultural work on the seventh year to commemorate his act of creation, just like we do on the weekly Shabbat. His instructions of not sowing or reaping in the seventh year, with the promise that he would send great blessings in the year preceding it, so that they would have sufficient food until the next crop in the next cycle, was a test of faith to help develop their faith and Imuna further, and their willingness to be obedient to his commandments, and actually give the land its rest, and enter into the cycle of rest that he had planned for them also. And surprisingly, this was one of the hardest things for them to do because of their lack of faith. The prohibition only applied to agricultural and gardening work. The only thing that is permitted is watering the plants so that they won't die. During the Shabbat year, the produce of the ground is without owner, so anyone may eat freely and bring home as much as needed for their daily food. For the poor, the seventh year of rest in the land was to provide a source of food for them. The owners of the field were not to harvest that which grew of its own accord, or to prune, or similarly to tend their vines or trees. And during this year, everyone, Israelite as well as foreign resident, Gentile, had equal rights to eat of what grew on the ground. The Sabbath of the land, we call a Shemitah, teaches that our means of producing an income belongs entirely to Hashem. He gives us life, breath, land, health, eyesight, physical and mental abilities, everything that we need to survive. Everything belongs to Him, and He gives us everything we need with which to work our land and do our job, and to raise our family and educate ourselves and fulfill our divine mandate to have dominion over the land. We need to be constantly aware that this Babylonian economic and political systems are designed to draw men into captivity to the lust of the flesh, being self-sufficient, and into a mindset of determining their own destiny and feeling self-sufficient from God. The Babylonian systems that we are currently living with grip our world today and form the structure of this false society. But Babylon is going to be destroyed, it's prophesied, with all its merchandise, according to Revelation chapter 18 and 19. So if our hearts are bound up in the things of this world and our present cultural system, then we are still a part of the system that will come under his judgment. What he established in Israel is his pattern for the kingdom age. And this is what we're preparing ourselves for as we return to Torah and have it written upon our hearts. We are to live in this world as strangers just passing through on our journey to our final destination. And we are merely sojourners, just as Abraham and all those who have gone before us were. In verses 8 through 10 of Vayikra, it says, You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through your land. 
You shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his own family. This comparison between the jubilee and the Sabbath years is that both bear testimony to the Holy One's creation of the universe in six days and his rest on the seventh. They further note that the seven years of the Shemitah cycle allude to the 6,000 years of history that will be climaxed by the seventh millennial day, the millennial Shabbat, which will be a period of peace and tranquility. Notice how everything ancient Israel did in their day-to-day -day life brought them into worshipful relationship with their creator by causing them to recall both what he had done for them in the past tense as well as what he would do for them prophetically in the future tense. We also should follow this example and forge every aspect of our lives into a never-ending recognition and praise of Abba's grace and love for us, past, present, and future. The Shabbats of the land forced Israelites to depend totally on Hashem to bless them triple-fold on the sixth year so that they would have enough food to last on the seventh year as well as during year one again while awaiting the harvest of that year's crop the following year. We need to have that kind of faith to trust Abba Father implicitly for our provisions today and especially in the days to come as we are soon to enter the time of tribulation. Think back of the ways and times he has supernaturally provided for you and your family when you thought there was no way through. These laws concerning the land and the Shemitah were a glorious opportunity to learn to trust Hashem and to demonstrate faith in our loving Creator and for Him to bless them abundantly on the sixth year and to see God's miraculous provision, thereby strengthening their faith and receiving even more blessings from Him the next time which resulted in them progressively growing even to higher levels of spirituality and faith. The rabbis generally understood this word for jubilee, yovel, to mean the ram's horn. However, it also carries the meaning of set out and freedom of movement. And it's also synonymous with a river to which the roots of a tree planted by the river's edge will grow. This gives it the sense of a return to our roots meaning thereby that all the fields return to their original owners and each generation goes back to its original status. And the Yovel was not only for the land, but also for the people of Israel. If the children of Israel today, as well as then, would have allowed God's divine providence to influence their lives, the corruption of society through murder and thievery and every imaginable sin and scandal could have been averted. The land is a divine gift from Heavenly Father. It is our inheritance that he promises to give back to us in the Messianic age. But we, as B'nai Yisrael, are his inheritance. He loves the people. For Israel, the people is the apple of his eye. And everything is his. Of course, the earth belongs to him and the people that dwell therein, because he has founded them both. The ownership of the land reverts to its original owners during the Jubilee year, and to attempt to sell the land permanently is actually a violation of the commandments in our parasha, and particularly to a non-Israelite who does not observe these commandments. And this is what brought about a loss of blessing upon Ariel Sharon and the land of Israel in 2006 and since 2006 when they gave away land in the Gaza Strip under pressure from the UN in the land for peace deal. But soon, even that land will be returned to Eretz Yisrael and the people of God in the next Yovel at the beginning of the age of Mashiach. Prophetically, the Yovel symbolizes the year of release from all bondage, all captivity, and enslavement. When everything in creation goes back to its original condition of purity and righteousness. And for this, the whole world travails and groans to be released from its burden of corruption that resulted from the defilement of sin, as Rabbi Shaul mentions in Romans 8.22. So the Torah mentions in this parasha that the shofar should be blown to announce this on the tenth day of the seventh month, which is Yom Kippur, to announce the year of setting free 
all in bondage. Then it says that the year ought to be consecrated and proclaimed as a year of liberty. This blast of the shofar was called the shofar hagadol, the great final blast of the shofar, to be distinguished from the first and second shofar blast, which occurred on the Feast of Shavuot and then on Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. This same event prophetically corresponds with the coronation of King Mashiach ben David. When Messiah comes, new liberty will be proclaimed to all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, as we approach the end of the book of Vayikra, we find that the Torah turns to the subject of what is fair and just in relations between man and his fellow man. Because God has to prepare us for coming back to the land and for observing his law of love to our fellow man in the land so it does not spew us out again. We are taught to effect justice in commerce and not to lend money with interest and not to mistreat or take advantage of a fellow believer who has sold himself into debt and to redeem a field that has been sold due to dire poverty. Although the book of Vayikra treats these matters of great holiness carefully, the Torah wishes to communicate that the proof of holiness is demonstrated when morality prevails over self-interest and self-seeking in our financial and business matters. Along these lines, the Torah prohibits wronging one another, which is called ona'a. And in verse 14, it says, And if you sell anything to your fellow man or buy anything from your fellow's hand, you shall not wrong him or you shall not wrong each other. And all of these laws are to sanctify us and to recreate us in the image of God, which is selfless instead of self-seeking. And this is why he had to specify the different ways that the selfish nature is exhibited in the children of Israel through his Torah. This means that whether there is a transaction of land or movable property lines, both the buyer and the seller are prohibited from defrauding each other or overcharging each other. A profit of up to one-sixth was permissible with movable property. But if the profit is more than one-sixth, the scale can be nullified. And if it is exactly one-sixth of its worth, the profit is returned and the sale would still remain valid. Even with land property, there is a prohibition against ona'a, which is monetary deception, as in fraud, or in this case, wronging another person by selling him something for more than it is really worth, or by purchasing it from a brother for less than its real worth, thus taking advantage of someone. Although these sales would still be considered valid, it is against Torah. And we need to take this to heart in our business dealings today in preparation of returning to the land. In verse 17, the text says, you shall not oppress one another. And this means to treat abusively. And the Torah prohibits wronging one another by means of even words. We are not to vex our fellow man, nor to offer someone inappropriate advice that would mislead them according to the way and the pleasure of the advisor. In other words, not for any personal gain. We are taught in Judaism, we are vessels to receive from Heavenly Father, but not for the self alone. We only receive so that we can join Heavenly Father as co-creators and blessers of others and of other things, multiplying the resources as good stewards that he's given us, but we don't receive for the self alone, thus denying the selfish nature in every thought, word, deed, and transaction. The rabbis understood that the Torah here is teaching against any form of maltreatment, even when no monetary gain is involved, such as verbal abuse or misleading someone. In any case, both applications of ona'a have one thing in common, and that is pressing one's advantage to the disadvantage of another or detriment of another. The fear of the Lord, this holy awe we have for Heavenly Father and His character and His ways is what prevents us from wronging one another. First of all, one who fears God knows that every person is created in His image to be like Him. Therefore, He ought to be respected, we know, because He has the Spirit of God within Him. And whatever we do to our fellow man, it's as if we are doing it to 
our Creator and Heavenly Father Himself. Deceiving anyone financially or mistreating anyone verbally is not permitted. One who deceives and oppresses his fellow man is hurting God in them. Therefore, the fear of God will cause people to treat others with respect and love. When God's people live in the light of the knowledge that they are but passing through this life and all they have and use upon this earth is but temporarily entrusted to them, they do not claim ownership of goods and properties. We are all just stewards. In this mindset, all are but passing through this life on a pilgrim journey, partaking of the generosity of the true owner of all things. And we should all seek to be the best stewards possible of what Hashem has entrusted to us. Now, in summary, Parsha Behar, the first of our double Torah portion today, instructs us in 24 new mitzvot covering these subjects derived from chapter 25 mainly. And there's one mitzvah from chapter 26, the first verse, which I'll quickly share with you before we go into our study on Behukotai. In chapter 25, verse 4, we are instructed not to work the earth during the sabbatical year and not to do any work with trees during the sabbatical year. In verse 5, we are told not to harvest that which grows wild during the sabbatical year, and not to gather the fruits of the trees during the sabbatical year in the way that it is normally gathered every year. In verse 8, we are instructed regarding counting seven cycles of seven years up to the Jubilee. Just like we're in the process of counting the Omer now, it's very important for God to keep us on his timing, his calendar. And so he tells us to count, to be aware of these cycles of seven leading up to the Jubilee. Unfortunately, largely in part, this has been lost. This knowledge has been lost. We know that Israel entered the land of Israel under Yehoshua's leadership in the 50th Jubilee, which would have been 2,450 years from creation. But since that time, the year of Jubilee is debatable by different leaders in Judaism because they stopped counting these cycles of sevens, unfortunately. And this is the only reason why the age of Mashiach and Messiah's coming will be a surprise to many. In verse 9 and 10, we are instructed regarding sounding the shofar on the Day of Atonement in the Jubilee year and sanctifying, setting apart this Jubilee year. In verse 11, we're told not to work the land during the Jubilee year. And this goes back to verse 5, where he tells us not to harvest produce that grows wild during the Jubilee year. Also in verse 11, we're told not to gather the fruit of the trees in the manner that we normally do in the other years. In verse 14, we derive two mitzvah to enact justice between any buyer and seller in transactions. So that means we're actually responsible to even help others in their transactions. We are to have a system of justice between buyers and sellers and be ethical in our transactions as we are not to ever wrong anyone ourselves, whether buying or selling. In verse 17, we're told not to oppress a brother in Israel verbally. And in verse 23, we are not to sell a field in the land of Israel permanently. Because remember, the land always is to stay in the tribe of its inheritance. Verse 24 tells us to return the land of Israel to its original owners at the Jubilee year. Verse 29 instructs us to redeem inherited property in a city until a year from its sale. And verse 34 of chapter 25 tells us not to alter the open land around the cities of the Levites or their fields. And in verse 37, we are instructed not to charge interest when lending to a fellow Israelite. In verse 39, it says, if an Israelite becomes poor, we are not to make them do the work of a slave. Rather, if we give a loan to someone and they become our indentured servant, we are to treat them like an employee with respect. In verse 42, we are not to sell a Hebrew slave because we know we'll take care of our Hebrew brothers and sisters and we'll treat them with respect. But if you sold a slave to someone in the Gentile nations, they would be mistreated inevitably. 
And we are to remember that all Hebrews are servants of the Most High. They're not really our servants, even if they are working for us or indebted to us. In verse 43, we are not to work a Hebrew slave with hard labor. And in verse 46, we derive the mitzvah that an Israelite may keep a foreign slave, a Canaanite slave, while living in the land, and pass that slave on to their children. God did make allowance for that. In verse 53, we are not to allow a Hebrew slave to be overworked or treated harshly. And in the first verse of 26, where we derive our last mitzvah for Behar, we are told not to bow down to any carved statue or any standing stone or idol. And that brings us to the second parsha of our double tor parsha, Behukotai, which begins in chapter 26, 3. And it introduces one of the central aspects of the covenant made through Moshe of obedience to Yah's statutes. The Torah clearly teaches in it that blessing is predicated upon obedience to even the hoke laws that we might not understand. The parasha begins, If you pursue my hoke laws, observe my mitzvot, and obey them. So here's three categories. We're supposed to pursue, like the, our life depends on it, the, even the laws we don't understand, and observe all of his mitzvot commandments, and obey them, which means observing them and obeying them each have their own special meaning. Then we will be blessed. And Rashi explains that this means that one must toil in the study of Torah, as he tells us to pursue his hok laws. Some of them we might not even understand, but we're to pursue the meaning through our Torah study. And pursuing the Torah's deep riches every day will bring blessings back into our life. The word huk here, the root of behukotai, means a statue or a decree that is beyond our reasoning, which gives the parsha of behukotai its name which literally means engraved. The Torah comes in two forms, of course, from Sinai, oral and written. But even within the written, there are two forms, one that Moshe wrote, but one that God engraved with his own finger. On the last day of his life, Moshe inscribed the Torah on parchment scrolls. But this written Torah was preceded by an engraved Torah, the divine law, was first given to us, encapsulated in those beautiful sapphire stones of the Ten Commandments, which were etched by the hand of God and by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we now have the Torah being engraved upon our hearts and our beings. And this is what ultimately is going to be fulfilled, as Jeremiah prophesies in Jeremiah 31, 31, that God will not make the covenant like he did with our forefathers in the future, writing them on tablets of stone and on scrolls of parchment, but he is going to write his laws of love upon our heart so that we live them out naturally. But covenants require a response on the part of the follower, so it doesn't mean that him writing it on our heart does away with the earlier covenants. Hashem, for his part, has provided the promise of inheritance for all who participate in the Abrahamic covenant. The response to this covenant is faith, but that faith is a faith that works out its love and devotion to Hashem through obedience. The nature of the Mosaic covenant is blessing and maintenance and enjoyment of promise on the basis of obedience. And the second parasha, Behukotai, begins in Leviticus 26, verse 3, saying, If you will walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will provide your rains in their time, and the land will give its produce, and the trees of the field will give its fruit. Your threshing will last until the vintage harvest, and the vintage will last until the sowing. And you will eat your bread to satiety, where you're totally satisfied, and you will dwell securely in your land. I will provide peace in your land, and you will lie down with none that frighten you. I will cause wild beasts to withdraw from the land, and a sword will not cross your land. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. 
Five of you will pursue a hundred, and a hundred of you will pursue ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. I will turn my attention to you, and I will make you fruitful and increase you, and I will establish my covenant with you. You will eat very old grain and remove the old grain to make way for the new grain. And I will place my sanctuary in your midst to dwell among you, and my spirit will not reject you. And I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be a people to me, or you will be my special people. All of this, this is a big if-then statement. If we will walk in his statutes, his hok laws, and keep his mitzvah, and perform them or do them. The word if is understood as a plea on the part of God. If only you would follow my statutes, because he wants to bless us. And even the Talmud confirms this in Avodah Zerah 5a. God is pleading with us. He wants to bless us. And this is so beautiful when we look at it this way. As a loving father who desires only our good, his heart longs that we might choose to do what is right, that he might not have to chastise us or allow us to experience the cause and effect of living out of harmony with his laws, that he can bring us to the path of life and blessings. He would rather shower us with blessings than use corrective discipline upon us. These punishments that Israel experienced and that were promised here if they disregarded his laws were temporary and they were meant to only be corrective as when a child trespasses and breaks the family covenant, he is not excluded from the family, but disciplined with love and with the intent that he would learn and grow from the experience of cause and effect. So it is with our Heavenly Father. His love is unconditional, but not without corrective chastisement. It is meant to correct us, and this is why the scripture says, He loves those whom he disciplines and chasteneth. In verse 23, Hashem warns them about behaving casually with him. Remember, anything holy is set apart from that which is common. And sometimes we can get too familiar or too casual with Heavenly Father, and that also can cause us to disregard his law. An attitude of familiarity that breeds contempt for his instructions. In the Targum, on Kelos, the word is interpreted with the meaning of withholding. That is withholding obedience from a heart that has become hardened or casual. This speaks of willful disobedience and disregard for his instructions to us also, going one's own way. It is the attitude expressed by the actions rather than the behavior itself. From a new covenant perspective, some teach that all of the curses of the law have been removed in Messiah. It is a common teaching based on Galatians that Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah in Galatians 3.3 3, that often gets mistranslated and misunderstood. This seems to indicate that in Messiah, the curses are removed, but we know neither has the sin been removed nor has the curses. We're all still experiencing the cause and effect of living out of harmony with the eternal principles from Torah. But people like to promote that the curses are removed, but the blessings remain which we know is not the case. The curse of the law spoken of in Galatians 3.13 by Rabbi Shaul is not the curses for disobedience listed out in Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28. The curse of the law in Galatians is the end result of the spiritual condition of being separated from God, which is death. And in fact, the second death, the eternal death, the judgment upon man's sinful state, which is eternal separation from God. This is different from the curses which come from acts of disobedience of a redeemed community or a person who are in covenant relationship with the Holy One. According to Rabbi Shaul, the curse of the law is the cause and effect separation from the life source leading to the judgment of the second death. This is the curse that Yeshua was willing to go through for all men as the second Adam when he took the penalty of sin upon himself so that all who accept his atonement would be delivered from its consequences. It is this condemnation from which we have been redeemed and which we see verbalized as being nailed to the cross in Colossians 2.14. 
The certificate of debt that it mentions that has been taken out of the way and nailed to the cross is the judgment of eternal death. And Paul is greatly misunderstood. And so I like to clarify the difference here. This is the ultimate curse of the Torah law. It is this curse which Messiah took upon himself in becoming a curse for us. Therefore, it is incorrect to suppose that there are no longer any consequences for sin, and sin is described as the transgression of the Torah. The ultimate consequence of condemnation has been removed, but the laws of cause and effect are still very much at work. Sin still reaps punishment. Obedience to God still results in blessings. And this is what Rabbi Shaul was speaking of in Romans 4.15 and chapter 5 of Romans and chapter 7, as well as 1 Corinthians 3.9. It's interesting that the rewards for keeping God's commandments are returned in the physical realm of life to give us abundance. As Yeshua says, I come to give life and give it more abundantly. And we receive this abundance in the things which we need for our lives. Whereas the absence of his blessings cause us to labor harder under the heaviness of our existence when things don't go well for us. But it's all to teach us. That's why we say, Gamzule Tova, it's all for our good, with the intent that it will be corrective and that we will turn our hearts towards God again in Teshuva, seeking his deliverance from the result of our errant ways. The blessings of obedience are an encouragement to continue in the bond of the covenant in relationship with Heavenly Father. And the curses which we reap from eating the fruit of our own errant ways are meant to keep us from going on unchecked in our rebellious lifestyle. After the blessings come, the rebuke or the punishment listed in chapter 26, verses 14 through 45. And there's a long list, harshly detailed, prediction of what will befall the people of Israel when they turn away from God. His reproof to them, found in this section, is in Hebrew, the tokhacha, a minor listing of curses brought against the people of Israel for their disobedience. A similar yet major listing, also referred to as tokhacha, can be read in Parsha Kitavo, which we get to in Devarim, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Hebrew word tohaha means reproof, correction, or a reprimand. And by its context, we understand this cause and effect as it conveys the purpose of divine retribution in bringing us to teshuva and thus saving us. Interesting by comparison, the Hebrew of this current chapter is written in the plural, addressing collective Israel, whereas its counterpart in Devarim 28 is written in the singular as it pertains to each one of us individually. But we have an understanding in Judaism that every person matters and every deed matters. Everything you do affects me and everything I do affects you. So this is why we see it in both contexts of the individual as well as the collective of Israel. There are three things which are listed here specifically as a mandate for the blessings to follow. And they are, you shall not make idols for yourself. Two, you shall keep my Shabbats. And three, you shall reverence my sanctuary. These are the priorities of worship, of loving him with all our mind, heart, and soul, and strength. Which, if we do, he says eight promises to us in this passage. One, I will give you the rain in its season, as we read. Two, that the land will yield its produce, and the trees shall yield their fruit. And three, that the threshing shall last to the time of the harvest, meaning no shortage of supply. And fourthly, we will eat bread to the full, meaning full satisfaction and nourishment from what we eat. And five, we will dwell in the land safely, and he will give peace to us and to the land. And the sixth promise is that he will rid the land of anything that will harm us, including evil beasts and enemies. And the seventh promise is a promise of power over our enemies to overcome them. And the eighth promise is, he says, I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful and multiply you, meaning in 
your seed, in your offspring, in your generations, and I will confirm my covenant with you and with your children. These are beautiful promises. And Hashem says that he will confirm or maintain the covenant, or more correctly translated, he says, I will cause my covenant to stand, in essence, forever with our people. In other words, he's going to cause the promises of the covenant to stand as well. He says also, I will set my tabernacle among you so that he can dwell among us and walk with us and be our God and we will be his people. His literal presence with Israel was a part of his covenant with them at Sinai. He said, my presence will go with you back in Exodus 33. And in the land, his tabernacle was set up as a permanent dwelling place among them. So it continued with them while they kept his covenant. But then the Shekinah left as the people were divided, even before they were exiled out of the land. Just division amongst brothers caused God's spirit to leave, which is quite an amazing concept for us to meditate on today. That's why, as I was mentioning earlier, we avoid at all cost any form or conversation that causes division. Before commencing the blessings in this parasha, Hashem states, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, showing that the blessings were conditional. Before the curses, he states, but if you will not hearken to me and will not do all of these commands, in verse 14, and if you shall despise or your soul abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you will end up breaking my covenant, the standards applied to the blessings evidently differ from those relating to the curses. Thus, the curses are not to be administered upon the mere transgression of the laws, as time is intended to be given for a person to repent, but only upon despising and abhorring them, as noted by Sephorno, if you shall despise my statutes beyond mere violation, you will despise them, and if your soul loathe my judgments consciously, in other words, loathe them as one might willfully spew out something that is objectionable, then we see more immediate retribution or judgment. Thus, the preconditions of the blessings radically differed from those of the curses. The understanding is that it is the rejection of his commandments that really brings the ultimate curse, not the failure to keep them perfectly or one who might sin by accident or ignorance or by one whose heart is toward him and who fails through weakness of the flesh. These statutes are defined for the corporate body of Israel, meaning the whole house of Israel, including those who join themselves to greater Israel through being crafted in and all of their descendants from its founder, the author, and the finisher of our faith. These statutes stand as eternal decrees and permanent rules and were not annulled by Yeshua at all, as some teach. These statutes are also considered the laws or instructions enacted by our legislative branch of divine government through the Holy One, blessed be He. Throughout the discourse of this Devar Torah, we see that blessings are given to those who observe His statutes in obedience, but to those who are given to disobedience, we see punishment, the natural cause and effect. Even in the natural, there is a consequence to disobeying the laws and instructions which govern a unified community of people formed into an association such as a society or a nation. And Hashem assures us that if we will obey his statutes, we will be so busy with prosperity that we will still be busy threshing grain when the time comes to harvest our grapes. And even then, we will still be occupied when it comes time to sow the grain field the next year. Even the very old grain and the stored crops from previous years will remain fresh and even improve with age so that the old grain will be superior to the new. It's amazing verbiage. And when the new crops come in, new storage houses will need to be built in order to make room for the new crops. These passages of scripture are rich with the fullness of being close to Heavenly Father's heart and blessings. However, it does come at a price to us. The cost for the Holy One's favored hand of blessings will require us to be obedient and faithful to His statutes, 
for they are the very laws of life themselves. However, we have the freedom of choice, and if we choose our way above his, we will face a series of cause and effect that remove the blessings from us. This is what becomes known as the curse or punishment. And the first series of punishments are as follows in our parasha. He says, but if you will not listen to me and will not perform all of these commandments, and if you consider my decrees loathsome, and you reject my ordinances so as to not perform all my commandments, and you annul my covenant, then I will do the same to you. I will assign you panic and swelling lesions, sores, and burning fever, which cause eyes to long and souls to suffer. You will sow your seeds in vain, for your enemies will eat it, and I will turn my attention against you. You will be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you will subjugate you. You will flee with no one pursuing you. This is the first step for Heavenly Father waking up his people and turning them back in repentance to him and his commandments. And if that doesn't return them, the second series of punishments are, if you, despite this, do not take heed to me, then I shall punish you further, seven times more for your sins. Now this passage in Leviticus 26.20 20 is the basis that was actually fulfilled and giving understanding to the time frame that Israel would be considered lost tribes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as Yeshua referred to them. For they were only intended to be chastised and punishment in exile by Assyria for 390 years. Remember Ezekiel lying on his side 390 days to tell Israel this, to wake up and repent. But God had promised, if when you're out of the land and you experience the first punishment, if you do not repent, you will be punished seven times moreover. And because our forefathers did not repent, this prophecy here in Leviticus 26, 20 kicked in. And seven times, 390 years began from the time Assyria took them captive in 722 BC and took them north of the Euphrates. And that brings us to 2008-2009, when Israel were, for all intensive purposes, considered lost tribes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they had such a veil over their eyes, they even forgot their own identity, as our fathers and forefathers often did. And so you come to America or other countries not even knowing your true identity. But you'll notice that in the last years, uh, since 2008-2009, when this punishment was lifted, what a great awakening the children of Israel have experienced. And this is what is so beautiful about people returning to Torah since then in preparation of Messiah's soon coming, where he will return us to the land and we will be required to keep these commandments in the land once again and to also teach the nations these laws. So there's many reasons why we need to return to the Torah and have it written upon our hearts so that we not only live by it, but we can be a light in the nations we are living and teach it to the nations in the millennial kingdom. Hallelujah. If, though, Israel, as they were prophesied, would not repent after the second series of punishments, the third series of punishment was described as, if you behave casually with me and refuse to heed me, then I shall lay further blows upon you, seven times like your sins. I will incite the beast of the field against you, and it will leave you bereft of your children and decimate your livestock and diminish you, and your roads will become desolate. And we see this happening at different periods of Israel's migrations through history being fulfilled. The fourth series of punishments are, if despite these you will still not be chastened in teshuva toward me, and you behave casually with me, then I too will behave toward you with casualness, and I will strike you, even I, seven times for your sins. I will bring upon you the sword, and avenging the vengeance of the covenant, which you will be gathered into your cities. And then I will send a pestilence among you, and you will be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And we have seen this fulfilled as well. All with a loving heart to bring us to teshuva repentance, to return to Torah, to forsake our sins. He says, when I break for you the staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and they will bring back your bread by weight. You will eat and still not be satisfied. 
And the fifth and last series of punishments are, if despite this still you will not heed me, and you behave toward me with casualness, I will behave towards you with a fury of casualness. I will chastise you, even I, seven times for your sins. You see him keep reiterating this. You know, whenever something is reiterated in Torah, it's because there's great importance behind it. He wanted Israel to recognize the time of their punishment as being seven times 390 years, which is 2,730 years from 722 BC, so that they would be able to recognize their true identity when that punishment lifted and that veil lifted and their hearts were pricked to come out of the pagan systems of religion they had assimilated into and return to God's ways. He says, you will eat the flesh of your sons even. This is how bad it's going to get. And this was actually fulfilled as well. And the flesh of your children you will eat. I will destroy your lofty buildings. We've seen that fulfilled. And decimate your sun worship. I will cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my spirit will reject you for a time. I will lay your cities in ruin, and I will make your sanctuaries desolate. We've seen this even with Jerusalem itself, the apple of God's eye, and the temple mount. And I will not savor your satisfying aromas. I will make the land desolate, and your foes who dwell upon it will be desolate. And you, I will scatter you among the nations. I will unsheathe the sword after you, and your land will be desolate during this time, and your cities are ruined. And sure enough, Israel, the ten tribes, have been scattered amongst the nations for the last 2,700 and now about 40 years. But this is not vengeance in operation, but a greater measure of loving discipline required by the stiff-neckedness of our rebellious forefathers and their failure to repent in the previous lighter measures of judgment, which required him to exert greater pressure on them. Because of Israel's disobedience and failure to observe the commandments and the keeping of the sabbatical years, they were exiled from the land into Babylon for 70 years and by Assyria, north of the Euphrates, for 390 years and then times seven. During that time, the land made up for the rest in which it had been deprived. It's amazing that those 70 cycles of seven is exactly the time period that Israel was punished for. The Israelites, both Judah and Ephraim, have been scattered throughout the nations of the world now, and that has been fulfilled, and have even been cut off from one another and divided. But God promises in Ezekiel 37 that he's going to bring them back together again, and that is our commission as the Son of Man. He says, Son of Man... Take two sticks representing each one and bring them close together and I will make them one again. And this is the day for that to be fulfilled. God is calling us back, not only to his Torah, but to him as the one true God of Israel, to the Hebrew language, and soon back to the land. Hallelujah. But if we are ever able to experience the heights and depths of a real relationship with the Holy One of Israel, it will require not only our faith, but our obedience. Faith without works, we're told, is dead in James. And if we say we love God and keep not his commandments, then we are a liar and the truth is not in us. For love is a word of action and it requires work to show forth our affection and love. If we are in love with something or someone, it requires faithfulness to that person. So then, does faith in Yeshua and his death annul the commandments of God? May it never be, God forbid. What our faith, in fact, does is establish a unique and personal relationship with our God through Yeshua's perfect example of obedience to Torah as a living Torah, showing us the way to be living Torahs as well. Our faith in Yeshua does not lessen our commitment to God's instruction and statutes, but it brings about a synthesis of love and obedience and a desire to never wander far from his divine presence ever again. Because Yeshua was revealed as an example of a living Torah, the Torah is now a document meant to be lived out in the lives of faithful followers of Yeshua through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to the glory of Heavenly Father. It should not be presumed that it can be obeyed in one's own strength with the selfish nature as strong as it is or automatically or legalistically as we need to die to self and let the Spirit of God live in us and through us. We have to do teshuva 
and we have to walk in imuna, which means faithfulness to God, just as he is faithful to us, and trust in the empowering of his spirit of truth within. Nor can it be performed mechanically without having a true motivation of love for God and for others. Torah observance is a matter of the heart, and the idea of commandment keeping is a state of mind as well as a daily function that connects us to Hashem. Because even in Hebrew, the word mitzvah, which we interpret as commandment, actually means connection. And it is through each of the 613 mitzvot that the different aspects of our soul reconnect to Hashem and we are able to be recreated in his image of selfless love. Now, altogether, in this parasha of Behukotai, in this last chapter of Vayikra, there are 12 new mitzvot comprised of seven positive commandments and five prohibitions. And in closing, I'll just quickly give you an overview of what they are and what verses they come from. In chapter 27, verse 2, we are instructed about one who vows to give a man's valuation should give the price written in scripture. This is in regards to servants. In verse 10, we are not to substitute animals consecrated for holy things. And if an animal consecrated as an offering is substituted for another one, both become consecrated to the Lord. Once you consecrate or vow something to the Lord, you're never to take it back and you're never to treat it as common ever again. So this is very important with our vows and the things that we promise the Lord. In verses 11 and 12, we derive the fourth mitzvah in this parsha that one who vows in animals valuation should give the price that the priest values it at. This way, it's not subjective by the individual giving it. And in verse 14, one who vows the valuation of a house should give the value that the priest values it at with the addition of one-fifth. In verse 16, we get the instructions in one who vows the valuation of a field should give the value set in scripture. And in verse 26, we are told not to substitute consecrated animals from one type of offering to another. We have to give exactly what Hashem has told us for each specific case, as each one is very symbolic. In verse 28, if one vows a thing consecrated to God, which we call a harem in Hebrew, on the part of his property, it must go to the priest. Because remember, the priests had no inheritance of their own. They're taking care of God's land and God's provisions in the temple. And so if somebody vows something to God, it is to be given to the priest, including property. And in verse 28 also, we see that land put by its owner under these harem laws consecrated to God is not to ever sell it, but to give it to the priest. And land as well that is consecrated to God is not to be redeemed at any price. In verse 32, we get the instruction that the tithe of kosher species of animals are to be given every year. And in verse 33, certain animals are not to be sold but as they're consecrated to God, only offered before the Lord and eaten in Jerusalem. Now, as we have completed the book of Vaikra, which is the third book of Torah, we congratulate each other with the encouraging words to continue in our Torah studies saying, Hazak, Hazak, Venit Hazak meaning be strong, be strong, and may you be strengthened. So feel free to encourage each other with hazak, hazak, venit hazak. You've just completed the third book of Torah.